Um, the second top point there is the objective for our narrow orchard systems project, uh, broken down into um, five key points there, and um, and it's all really you know focused on making sure our orchards are safer to attract a labour force, which of course has been a real big problem the last few years. Uh, the more more profitable, um, uniform. And there's accelerated adoption of robotic and sensing technology. So I've always sort of seen this as being part and parcel with the, uh, the the work we're doing with respect to narrow orchard systems. So it's not just about tree training, but it's also about uh, the the technology that uh, is appropriate for what we call narrow orchard systems. And of course, the final point there is about climate resilience and sustainability. Um, it's a five year project that commenced in June this year. And it was actually more than five years, about 5.5, um, the usual sort of carry over into a final, uh, an extra financial year in 2028 for the delivery of the final report, um, which is great having a project of this sort of duration. We hope to be able to at least get some um, pretty good bits of work done. Um, the project team, so our uh, well, partners and team. So uh, yeah, as um, Marguerite said, AgVic leads the project. Um, Deep Herd Western Australia is a partner, University of Queensland, New South Wales, DPI, Sardi and Plant and Food Research um, are all partners in the project. And I've listed the, the people that are in each one of the agencies that are working on this project um, and there's obviously people um, in, in this webinar whose names appear there, um, but I thought, uh, you know, this photo of captures pretty much all of the key people involved in the project. Um, and most of you, if you, I'll go from left to right, that's Ken Breen from Plant and Food. He was our host when we did a recent trip to the uh, site where they're doing that, um, the, the FOPS project. Uh, next to Ken is Mark O'Connell, uh, Steel Jacob, Alessio Scalisi, myself, Darren Gratz from uh, Sardi, uh, um, and that's Richard Oliver. <laughs> uh, Richard Oliver's in um, a sensing guy uh, based in Hamilton in New Zealand. Uh, is that Leachy there? Yeah, and Leachy, the second last guy is Leachy. So um, Leachy's, you know, Leachy Han, he's University of Queensland, so they're a partner in the project. And Kevin Dodds on the far right from New South Wales, DPI. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that's a, quite a nice photo to show, you know, some of the key players in the project. Uh, and in the background, of course, is the narrow row. Well, I, I'm not, I, I shouldn't call it that. It's the FOX experiment uh, that plant and food research have been doing for quite a number of years. Um, so, yeah, I thought to, at, at the start of this presentation, I'd just give a bit of a definition of what we mean by narrow orchard systems. And, and it's really our, our starting point for the work that we will be doing. So um, I've got there four key points. So first of all, you know, narrow orchard systems is about 2D narrow hedgerow canopies, what are often referred to as a, a fruiting wall. Uh, it's about narrow row spacings. In other words, two metre row spacings. It's about widely spaced trees within a row. So not high density, ultra high density down the row, but actually having trees spaced at two to three metres between the trees. And then the uh, what I'd, I'd call the training systems is the training system is about uh, multiple vertical leaders arising what is referred to uh, arising from what is referred to as a cordon uh, and that expression is quite commonly used in viticulture as a training system but basically laying a horizontal uh, structure limb in other words from which vertical leaders arise and you're looking at you know the six to ten uh, vertical leaders arising from that caught on. So that's basically the starting point of what our narrow orchard systems 
is all about. And we'll be doing work to look at things like um, root stocks and and how you can actually train um, uh, to a cordon system. Uh, we'll be looking at obviously different different crops and of course in different environments as well. Um, and with respect to a bit more background, um, there's already obviously work being done, not only in Australia, but overseas. So this is shows some of the uh, background that work that's already been done with respect to um, cordon systems in Australia. So, uh, you know, we've been working on using cordon on in our um, in our pear experiment here at Tatura. Uh, those photos there of, on the left-hand side, the two photos there of, of firstly the Tatura trellis or open Tatura trellis and a vertical system using a, a six, well, it's an eight liter on the open Tatura and a, and a six liter on the vertical training system. Directly underneath them is a block of plums from a commercial guy at Swan Hill uh, who's um, been um, using a cordon system for plums. Next to that is a photo of cherries, a cordon system on a on a traditional V, a traditional Tatura trellis V system, um, where there's you know somewhere between six and eight vertical leaders arising rising from the cordon. And then above that it's just showing the, you know, the basically the a, a V system of nectarine and a vertical system of nectarine, where I think Mark O'Connell was playing around a bit with um, using a cordon system on nectarines. Um, so there's a bit of background already been, you know, in in the, in terms of a cordon system in Australia. Um, in the United States, there's often referred to as a UFO system, which has been around for quite a while. Um, and again, it's, you know, obviously a, a planar a type canopy um, using a cordon system where the trees actually leaned over and, you know, the uprights arise from that. Uh, main stem where the where the where the cordon's laid at a bit of an angle to prevent the uh, end uh, to prevent the dominance of the vertical leaders arising from from close to the um, the, the trunk. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, again, you know that's on cherries. Um, that's Greg Lang, the guy there, who's obviously been done a lot of work and along with Matt Whiting on this system of um, training trees into planar systems using a cordon. And then probably the, you know, the most similar work to what, you know, we originally, what, what we are planning is doing as part of this project is, is you know, work being done in Italy uh, on what they refer to as the Guyo system. Um, I've added narrow row pedestrian Guyo because you know the the photo there on the right is a a a, a two meter row spacing and trees at two meter height, um, uh, and and the Guyo uh, training system is where you actually um, have trees from a nursery that have already got feathers on them. As this as the middle photo there shows a guy you know training the um, the vertical leaders that that's a tree that's just been planted planted so. You know, the Guyo system is a registered trademark, by the way, uh, of um, having trees from a nursery that are already feathered in the right position. So you can just basically have a, those those vertical leaders um, straight off the shelf, so to speak. The photo there on the left too is an interesting one because, <clears throat> and and Dario will be doing a bit of this work in Western Australia where, where the cordons are actually um, arched over each other to stop them from... You know, when you're trying to bend over cordons, you can often um, crack them or break them. Um, so, you know, that method there has been used to try and avoid that from happening. Uh, that, that I think, is referred to as a, a double GUIO system. Um, and, of course, you know, the work that's been done in New Zealand as part of their Future Orchard Production Systems project, um, I've... You know, I've added a few more words to the description of it because I think it's a narrow row, tall, planar cordon system. So, you know, where they landed is, um, and there's a photo there of Marco Cole, by the way, um, with his arms outstretched in the one of the treatments that was a 1.5 metre row spacing. Uh, 
but I think where they landed is, you know, the preference for a two metre row spacing. Um, and the critical thing from the bit of work that was done in New Zealand, and this was probably the impetus to for us to, you know, do the work in in Australia and, and obviously get the funding from Port Innovation was that uh, yield response function that's shown there with, with light as per, you know, Stuart Tustin's publication in Cyanea Horticulturae. Um, you can see that, you know, you're getting yields uh, some of those dots are getting up around, you know, 200 tonne per hectare. And that is, um, well, that's exceptionally high yields. Um, and uh, and a light corresponding to a light interception of, you know, getting up towards 80%. So, you know, obviously with a, a narrow row, tall trees, uh, you know, the, the amount of light that can be intercepted is, is obviously getting very high. Um, and associated that with the work that I've done is you know, very high yields. So what are we going to do? Uh, this slide here is lists the sites where we're doing both uh, setting up experiments as well as some demonstration sites. Uh, here at Tatura, we'll have both a, a, a reasonably large experiment as well as a demonstration block. So we'll be working on pear, apple, plum, nectarine and cherry. The table there just gives you, I won't go through them, but it gives some detail of the different root stocks uh, that we'll be doing in this experiment. So basically every crop has got three different root stocks. And I think root stocks are going to be critical for narrow orchard systems to work. Um, in Australia, we're, we're probably more concerned about lack of vigour with some of these dwarfing rootstocks and not being able to fill the canopy, um, as opposed to, you know, environments like in, in New Zealand and even the United States, you know, where they've got much uh, deeper soils, um, you know, they, they, they still have to try to contain the um, vegetative vigour on some of these dwarfing rootstocks. So, yeah, it, it, you know, we're, we're thinking that um, we might actually not be able to fill the the, the actual uh, allocated canopy space um, with um, in our environment with some of these rootstocks. Manjim up, focusing on apples, um, loxton, apricot, uh, and looking at the combination of a few different cultivars as well as different rootstocks. Um, the guys at Sardi will also have also set up a an experiment in the Adelaide Hills on a you know commercial property, global orchards uh, on cherry, where they'll be looking at not it, it won't be a you know a two meter row spacing. I think it's a three meter row spacing in the orchard, uh, but the, there's a comparison between a, a vertical UFO system versus a, a V system. Uh, but again, you know, plain are very narrow canopies, which is of course. A significant component of this project, component of this project as well, um, and and a uh, Kevin Dodds has been um, uh, trying to establish a demonstration site at in Batlow, um, and he's he's got a guy up there who's just planting an orchard at the moment, um, a three meter row spacing on a cordon system. Um, in other words, 2.4 metres between the trees with eight litres on each one of those trees, eight vertical litres, uh, and aiming to get to a 3.5 metre canopy height. So uh, Kevin's um, quite excited about this project, as we all are, but you know, Kevin in particular is he's an extension officer and pretty keen to make sure that they have a significant contribution to make for their um, growers in this uh, in narrow orchard systems. Um, UQ are going to do um, studies on digital twin simulations. University of Queensland, that is. Uh, Leach is obviously the main person uh, to do this work. So um, uh, he, he's really got two main components of work. The first one here is on orchard design to maximise light interception. So he's... Um, I'll just hit the down button to show a you know a lidar scan of 
you know, trees that we actually did a few years ago at Tatura. But uh, what, you know, Leach is going to be doing is, um, first of all, calibrate and validate his, his uh, light simulating light simulator model that he's got, which basically picks up on a digital twin that you create from a, a, a LiDAR image. Um, our first bit of work that we'll do is to make sure that that uh, existing light simulator is um, uh, it, it, it is appropriate or and, and works for you know stone and palm fruit. Uh, he's obviously done a lot of work in tropical fruits to develop the light simulator and uh, our job first of all is to make sure it, it works for for our crops so we'll be comparing what might what gets generated from his simulation uh, model using lidar scans of canopies of palm and stone fruit trees compared with uh, our physical measures of light interception with the for example the light trolley shown in the, the photo there on the on the right, so that's the first sort of cab off the rank, and then, then the the plan is to build a a tool that can be used by industry to help best design an orchard for a particular environment, so that it can uh, maximise light interception, and of course, what I mean by light interception is combination of total light interception by the tree, but also light distribution down through the canopy because that's obviously critical. Uh, and the third dot point there is that uh, Leachy will do a bit of work on uh, e exploring the relationships between what gets simulated by the model in terms of light incidence on at a particular point within the canopy and fruit color and floral initiation. So I'm, I'm quite excited about that last dot point because I think you know, I've got an opportunity here to use the technology, i.e. You know, lidar and optical images to automatically you know capture this really really uh, you know large and um, rich data set that then we can look at you know establishing relationships between uh, that light incident at any point in the canopy and what it's doing in terms of um, the productivity of the crop um the other bit of work that Leach's group will do is on, uh, you know, uh, sprayer designed for narrow orchard systems to maximise obviously you know, um, spray efficiencies. So again, he's already got a, a model that he developed for um, tropical fruits and he'll validate that for um, pine and stone fruit, temperate crops in other words. Um, then the second dot point there is about designing a sprayer for narrow orchard systems that actually you know, maximizes the efficiency of application. So the photos there are just giving you some idea of the, you know, the different options of sprayers that firstly, what we currently use on the far left there, that's our air blast sprayer, we've got a Tatura. Um, secondly, that those over the row type sprayers that are common, well, not common, but they are used in viticulture. Um, Thirdly, a, a very you know simple sprayer that isn't an air blast. It's just basically using pressure to apply the spray. If we're talking about an, a thin canopy, maybe that's all we need. And and the last sprayer there on the right is um, is a, a, a it's a tower sprayer. Uh, you know that that one there is only two meters high, but you know you you can get them that are I think are about three point five meter high. You know, tower spray it's got a um I've got the name of the fan on it but it's like a, a vertical fan uh as a but I, I i think um they're quite that, that to me will be just off the top of my head i think that's one of the um preferences i'd be using for uh narrow orchard systems a spray like that um the other as as i said earlier you know it's really critical that we bring along you know the ag tech and sensors that are appropriate and um uh, for narrow orchard systems not only appropriate but it actually can make you know narrow orchard systems work better uh perform better be more profitable in other words so during the progress of this uh project we'll be testing and evaluating demonstrating um various bits 
of ag tech, and I've got in brackets there in that first dot point about um, it's going to be governed by the project reference group. So that was uh, Port Innovation's idea was to bring along the project reference group with what ag tech might be available, but also have their inputs into you know where the gaps in equipment might lie. And of course, one of the first things that the growers, when we've had discussions with them about is, um, you know, two metre row spacing, you know, they're going to struggle to get a bin down the row. Well, mm, so, you know, think about, well, what ag tech can we actually use to overcome a problem of a, a bin, the lack of manoeuvrability of a bin being carted up and down a row. Um, so anyway, here's some, you know, some of the things that we've bounced around and got, you know, ideas of what we might use, um, whether it's a autonomous, uh, something like a burrow, which is shown in that photo on the left-hand side there. Uh, there's a autonomous tractor as well with a tower sprayer. That's the tower sprayer I was mentioning before with the higher uh, boom on the back. Um, in the middle there is the, it, it's, doesn't it's really hard to sort of um, see from that photo what it actually is, but that's a, a robotic harvester that's being developed by a company called Ripe Robotics in the Golden Valley. Um, and their their idea is to make the robotic harvester compact and small, which would be appropriate and suitable for you know, a two metre row space orchard, narrow orchard systems, in other words. Um, and have you know making them small enough and cheap enough that of course you can have multiple robotic harvesters. Um, and the photo there on the right is the Smart Apply variable rate sprayer. Um, that particular photo is the one we've got up at the Mildura um, mid area mid area smart farm. Um, Ian, can I have a question? I guess that's Dave, is it? Yes, it is. Thank <laughs> you. In, uh, in rainy Mildura, unfortunately. It's normally stinking hot, but it's not today. Um, are you guys going, do you have the equipment you need to manage your narrow rows, or will you have to simulate some of the expected costs associated with this? Do you have narrow tractors and all the equipment you need? Yeah, we do have uh, narrow tractors. And the... Um, even the air blast sprayer we we've got will go down a two meter row, mm. uh, but you know I'm pretty keen to progress the spray component word of bleachies because I want to purchase one of those you know a sprayer that's more suitable to a narrow orchard system right. Um, in terms of yeah we've got you know small enough slasher to go down the row so we've 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 got the equipment already to be able to you know, manage the block Dave. Oh, yeah, thank but, you. But, but it, 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 and and this sort of leads on to this next up point in some ways. What you just brought up, Dave, because th this one says, you know, can existing orchard management technology actually be used in a narrow orchard system, right? Um, and and so we'll be looking at. Uh, obviously, we've as I said, we've got the equipment already at Tatura to be able to. You know, I'm not. I'm not. I, sh I shouldn't answer for the others other sites, by the way, um, uh, and maybe Tim can answer that question later. And I'm not sure if, uh, you know, Dario is out of the country at the moment, but um, but it's not only that sort of obvious orchard equipment, but it's also things like, you know, I've got examples here of a, 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 a leaf blower and a Darwin flower thinner and a, and a hedger. So, you know, those sort of, you, you could easily argue, well, you shouldn't need a lot of this equipment, like a leaf blower and a hedger, in a well-managed narrow orchard system, you know, a planar canopy, um, but growers are still uh, cognizant is that mightn't be the case. They still might have to go up and down rows doing this sort of stuff, right? Um, and particularly, you know, I, I think of leaf blowing to allow better light through the canopy. And maybe if we do have a more vigor than we anticipate and we don't have enough light, you know, going through the canopy onto the adjoining row that, you know, a leaf blower technology might have actually have to be used. So, you know, the question I'm proposing here is, you know, can this equipment be used in narrow orchard systems? Um, and, and of course, you know, the technology to capture data. Uh, here I've got, you know, I think I gave a presentation about cartographer a few years ago, but 
you know, we obviously still you know, heavily rely on cartographer to take a lot of our measures within our experiments um, and we'll be continuing to do that. But of course, it, it also has a lot of applications for um, commercial orchard management as well. Um, and other sensors as well. I've got there a, a trunk dendrometer, um, the, you know, at the moment, they're, they're either going through a, 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 a Laura Wan, you know, system of communication or a proprietary type, you know, communication into a into the mobile system. So, you know, there's various options we're currently using. Um, but I think, um, you know, Dario in Western Australia is pretty keen to progress this a bit more to come up with a, a more universal, I'll call it that, system of capturing, you know, some of this sensor data that, and and also in the interpretation of the data too. And I've got there a graph of, you know, uh, that's a, um, a, a a trunk dendrometer showing its you know, shrinkage and swelling over a period of time of, of, of about, what is that, a, a, approximately a week um, during November. And there's still a, a necessary human intervention there in interpreting that data. And I think what Dara has got in mind is trying to use AI to interpret a, 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 a graph like that to determine whether trees need to be irrigated or not. Um, and the last uh, slide with, it's not the last slide, I think, but it's the last slide on the ag tech um, is to look at a, a couple of other ag technologies, one being the ability to actually size fruit in the orchard um, and uh, and automated retractable netting. We're definitely going to look at automated retractable netting at Tatura. And, um, and this particular image here is um, a video at least. It shows uh, it, it's actually an orchard in Ardmona close by here where they put in a, a, a bit of a trial to see whether they could use you know, automated retractable netting systems um, because you know you, with these netting systems you will start losing out in color and even potentially crop load and and fruit size so you know the idea is with the retractable netting automated retractable netting is you can draw it over when the conditions are uh, um, appropriate for excessive amount of radiation or, or a hail event etc the other photo on the left there is, you know, we've been here at Tatura just trying to develop a on, a, on our platform harvester, you can see that there's a box on one of the um, platform harvester conveyor belts, which has actually got sensors in it to measure fruit quality, including, you know, fruit size and, and, and colour. Um, and the proposal in this project is, you know, Dario's group are going to uh, um, pursue something similar to that, whether it's feasible to be able to do it in a narrow orchard systems, because that platform harvester there, as you can see, is a bit wide for going down a two metre row spacing. 